angry? Yeah! I hope you are frigging angry. Corals are bleaching and fish are moving because we have made their world uninhabitable. Tiny turtles are eating so much plastic that they are starving to death. And we have to say no new fossil fuel development anywhere in the United States. And it must be a just transition that leaves no workers behind. This is a collective crisis that requires collective action. We hold the power to change the political calculus in America. And this movement is spreading so fast. We're going to go raise a ruckus. Now we, we have an unprecedented chance to lay the groundwork, but it's gonna it's gonna be a fight, and that's why we need all of us to rise together. We are just getting started. Welcome to our third virtual fire drill Friday rally. I mean, you know it's a rally, right? Because I'm wearing my red rally coat. Today, um, today's ocean focused fire drill Friday rally was originally scheduled for last week, but we postponed it so that we could hear from three incredible leaders of the Movement for Black Lives Jessica Bird, Colette Pichon Battle, and Kinyere. To Tashinda. I, I hope that you were able to tune in because their message is really urgent, one we, we must all heed. But it's up on firedrillfridays.com if you'd like to watch the recording, and I hope you do. Because today is a rally, we won't be taking audience questions, but we have a live virtual audience. This is all live. I mean, you don't see them, but they're there and they're going to be watching alongside you. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge what has been a, an especially painful, tumultuous, and for many a very confusing time, but also a time of real change and hope all over the country and the world for that matter. Historically diverse crowds are filling the streets, peacefully protesting and demanding an end to racism and affirming that Black Lives Matter, and the protests are working. Over the last week, the movement for Black Lives has seen real movement on their policy demands. You know, as my friend and the director of Greenpeace US, Annie Leonard, she says, quote, when, when we've exhausted the polite levers that democracy offers us, we protest, right? Protest works. It makes the movement visible. It builds relationships and it strengthens our resolve. It communicates our sense of outrage and commitment, shifting the public consciousness and conversation. Nothing's ever changed without protest, without people in the streets. Protests create, it creates cracks in the, in the structures of power and it forces people to come to terms with issues that they may otherwise have ignored. This is how we grow our movement, folks. We at Fire Drill Friday stand with the movement for Black Lives, and we support their peaceful protests. The crowds have been courageous, peaceful, and diverse. Young, old, children, and people in wheelchairs, Latinx, white, black, all of them risking their lives in the midst of a pandemic to show up and demand justice. It's historic. Let's keep that front of mind and work together to answer the call for that much too long awaited justice. So as you know, today we're here to talk about oceans and climate. And while it may seem that 
climate, the climate crisis and ocean protection are, are disconnected from the fight for social and racial justice. I and our, our really extraordinary speakers today are here to let you know that that is not the case. As we've discussed many times over our months together with Fire Drill Fridays, people of color disproportionately bear the brunt of the climate crisis. I mean, think about the worst natural disasters you've seen on TV and the horrific damage they've done to neighborhoods and schools and homes. Now think about how it's predominantly people of color living in those communities, not receiving health care, not receiving safety and resources that they're entitled to, that predominantly white communities are privy to in the blink of an eye. Think also about the, the coal-fired power plants and oil wells that you see in communities of color. A few months ago, we had a Fire Drill Friday rally in Wilmington, and the San Pedro area of Los Angeles. Maybe you remember that. Oil rigs are literally in, in the driveways and front yards of homes and schools. I met people in those towns who had cancer and respiratory illnesses and heart disease because of the fossil fuel industry. We don't see that in Beverly Hills. And guess what? That is not a coincidence. I learned from Dr. Ayana Johnson, who's one of our speakers today, that people of color are significantly more concerned about climate change than white people, 57% versus 49%. And Latinx people are even more concerned, 70%. So to put that in perspective, it means that more than 23 million black Americans already care about the environment. Yet many people continue to treat the, the movement for racial and social justice and the movement for protecting the planet as completely separate, but they're not, okay? Now, we, we live on a relatively small planet on which there just happens to be the exact right balance of everything that's needed for life to exist. It may not exist on any other planet, but here it exists on this blue planet. It's an intricate balance of atoms and molecules of different life forms that are part of an interconnected, interdependent web. Everything is part of everything. And we, the animal species Homo sapiens, are part of that web. I mean, we may have bigger brains and prehensile thumbs, but we're part of that web. And like everything else, in order for us to exist, we need oxygen, we need water, and we need food. And 30% or more of the oxygen we breathe, it comes from the forests. The rest, about 70%, comes from the oceans, 70% of our oxygen comes from the oceans. Think about it. Take a deep breath. You didn't know it, but that breath connects us to the ocean. Everything, see, depends on everything. It's an exquisite, very fragile balance. And the oceans are our friends. They keep us alive. They also feed us. Three billion people get 20% of their protein from oceans. Oceans inspire us, right? They, they cover underground mountains that are taller than Everest. They contain deep lakes of scalding water and living creatures we have yet to discover and understand. And as John Hosevar, one of our guests today, has taught me, oceans are our biggest allies in the fight against climate change. They absorb 93% of the heat we generate and roughly 40% of the carbon dioxide we produce. But we are destroying them. We're heating them, we're acidifying them, we're overfishing, we're polluting with single-use plastic and other toxic waste, we're drilling into them. This has to stop. I'm hopeful that we will stop this. And our speakers today are a big part of my hope. And so to start us off, I am so honored to introduce Dr. Sylvia Earle, President and Chair of Mission Blue, 
and a National Geographic Society Explorer in residence. <laughs> Dr. Earl is called her deepness by the New Yorker and the New York Times, a living legend by the Library of Congress, and the first hero for the planet by Time Magazine. She's an oceanographer, explorer, author, and lecturer with a lifetime of experience as a field research scientist, government official, and director for corporate and nonprofit organizations. Please welcome Dr. Sylvia Earle. Thank you, Jane, for that generous introduction and for your, for your view of the ocean. Now we know, now the knowledge is there. It did not exist when I was a kid, when I was an aspiring scientist many years ago. Cause for hope now in 2020 is the knowledge that not only did not exist, but could not exist because we had not been high in the sky or deep in the ocean half a century ago. But here we are, early in the 21st century. Scientists are beginning to come out of their ivory towers to share the view in ways that we absolutely must have in order for, for people, everyone, to understand how dependent all of us are on the natural systems that make our lives possible. It's taken about four and a half billion years of fine tuning, shaping rocks and water into the planet that you describe that works in our favor. Just the right amount of oxygen, enough carbon dioxide to power photosynthesis. A planet that has not always worked in our favor, but it's taken us about four and a half decades to significantly unravel the underpinnings of what keeps us alive. So why wouldn't we use our mighty powers of knowledge to embrace the natural world with care, to embrace one another with dignity and respect, along with the knowledge that we have to work together to restore health to the natural systems, land and certainly the ocean. A healthy population of humans requires that we have a healthy planet. We could not see in prior times that there are limits to what we can take out of the ocean, take out of the land. We thought that we could dispose of wastes into the skies, we could, that, that we could throw things away. Now we know there's no way. We, as you point out, Jane, all of us now know this is it, this little blue miracle in a universe that is really inhospitable for the likes of us. We have the opportunity as never before and as never again to embrace what remains of healthy ecosystems on the land and in the ocean to develop a network of hope through looking at places that are still in good shape restoring what we can to places that have been diminished. This is a turning point, armed with knowledge, armed with knowing that, yes, we need to stand up and protest when we see wrongdoing. That's how this nation began, by standing up and protesting injustice. <laughs> This country would not exist, but for that spirit of identifying wrongs and trying to do everything in our individual and collective power to do the right thing. So we need diversity among ourselves. We need diversity of life on earth, protecting the natural systems that make, make a peaceful planet possible. We need to not just make peace among ourselves urgently, we need to make peace with nature urgently. So I salute you, all of you who are tuning in, all of you who have the power of knowing. That's our superpower as humans, the power of knowledge. 
we can take what we've got and work together to take where we are at this point in time, embrace the natural world, bring back health to the coral reefs, bring back health to the forests, bring back health from places all over the planet that have been diminished, have been harmed by our actions. And look at the deep sea, look at the high seas, the best chance we will ever have to protect half of the world, the high seas, the deep seas, to look at them not as a place to exploit, but a place to really embrace them with care while we still have time. So I thank you, all of you, for coming together now. Use your voice, use your power to make peace with one another and to make peace with the ocean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Earl. I appreciate you joining us. Um, and before I introduce our next speaker, I, I just want to acknowledge Graciela, who's joining us from Uruguay, Tila from the East Coast, and Laura from New York, and Robin from Ohio. Thank you so much for being with us. And, um, and now I'd like you to join Dr. Earl. Dr. I mean, <laughs> Niaz Dori, I'm sorry. Niaz Dori is our next speaker. She has been a community organizer for over 30 years. And it's very interesting to me. The, the, the life-changing um, moment for her came in 1994 when as a Greenpeace campaigner, she switched from organizing in communities, fighting for environmental justice, to organizing fishing communities. From the very beginning, she recognized similarities between family farmers fight for a more just and ecologically responsible land-based food system and that of community-based fisher people fighting to fix the broken sea-based food system. She's been serving as the coordinating director of the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance since 2008. And one of the first things that she did with NAM, with the North Atlantic Marine Alliance, after she took the helm, she joined, she had the organization join together with the National Family Farm Coalition as its first non-farming member. So these two organizations entered into a very innovative shared leadership model on, in May of 2018, putting NIAS in the new role of leading both organizations and further cementing the relationship between land and sea. This is, this is quite unusual and wonderful. Please join me in welcoming Niaz Dori. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate the introduction. <clears throat> and um, on behalf of NAMA, our over 400,000 fishing families in North America, and our sister organization, the World Forum of Fisher People, which represents over 10 million, fishing families, primarily in the Southern Cone. I wanna thank you for inviting me to be a part of this, especially my old Greenpeace colleagues and, and, uh, and friends, and really recognizing the role of community-based fishermen in achieving climate justice. You mentioned life-changing moment. There have been a number of them as it is for all of us almost, but it's, um, today happens to be an important marker for me because two years ago was another life-changing moment. I was, uh, on a tour, 13,000 mile journey across rural America with a 30 foot RV we'd rented. And one of the central stops was visiting uh, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, also known as the Lynching Memorial. That experience was definitely a life changing moment because it taught me a lot about how racism and slavery sits at the roots of our food system, whether it's our land food system or our seafood system. And I encourage anybody who uh, hasn't visited Montgomery, Alabama, hasn't visited the National Memorial for Peace and Justice to do so, especially in this moment in our history. I'm actually very proud of NAMA for taking position on racial equity issues. Um, back in 2013, as part of our collaboration with Food Solutions New England, uh, we made that announcement publicly. In 2015, we supported the platform by Movement for Black Lives. And again, two weeks ago, we issued a joint statement with National Family Farm Coalition 
each time getting pushback, getting belligerent emails, getting a lot of negative comments. But for us, it, it was really important to stand our ground and to stand in solidarity with people of color. And at this moment, Black Lives Matters and the Black Lives Movement. We not only stand in solidarity, but we've actually designed and developed our work so that we can demonstrate that. And that takes me to another life-changing moment, actually. You mentioned the work around environmental justice and how um, it's sort of visualizing the connection between family farmers and community-based fishermen. The other life-changing moment really was the moment that I read some of the stories about fishing communities, just about when I was contemplating whether or not I was going to switch campaigns. And again, another anniversary just earlier this week was with an old friend of yours, Martin Sheen, who was with us as we uh, performed civil disobedience at the gates of the, of the WTI incinerator in East Liverpool, Ohio. When I saw the signs that fishing communities were holding up in newspaper articles, they looked so similar to the signs that the community of East Liverpool was holding up. And suddenly I realized, wow, this has nothing to do with the oceans or the whale or the fish. This is another case of global movement of capital taking precedence over the planet, the people, and our health, whether it's our natural health or our human health. So that really, really was the key to my ability to be able to switch campaigns. And other life-changing moments came after reading a few more history books. And I realized that the, that the roots of, um, of what we call overfishing today really date back to when Europeans arrived here. Colonization is really the beginning of what we experience now as overfishing. These beautiful sailboats, these schooners that we now romanticize were brought here and suddenly what, what we were limited with the strength of our arms, the wind blowing, the fish swimming, that was what limited our ability to fish. These schooners came here. Not only did they destabilize indigenous people's ability to exist in this continent, but they also took these little, school, little dories, put them on the schooners, and for the first time, we went to where the fish were. For the first time, we began to demand fish 12 months out of the year, similar to how we demand strawberries 12 months out of the year. And we know what the ecological, social, economic, and food justice implications are of demanding strawberries 12 months of the year. We're experiencing the same thing when it comes to demanding the same species 12 months out of the year. That colonization was the beginning of the shift that we're now experiencing in the ocean. Shortly after that, multinational corporations led by neoliberal policies, led by policies that were rapidly expediting consolidation, industrialization, and privatization of the fishing rights and the access to the ocean itself. And who were the biggest victims? Indigenous people losing their rights to fish, coastal communities, especially in the southern cone, losing their access to their traditional way of life and the most important part of their diet. And those who need seafood most, those who rely on it as sustenance and subsistence, could no longer access it because the prices started to climb and false solutions that were designed to really appease the appetite of white privileged people took hold of the, of the so-called solutions um, uh, that we were introducing. Shortly thereafter, Wall Street took over and fishing rights became a commodity. The ocean became a commodity and we lost more and more of our commons. So how do we, and I think that's our task, how do we decolonize the ocean and occupy it at the same time? Because we need to kick up Wall Street out and we need to respect the treaties that we've signed with indigenous people. Number one is to uh, honor those treaties and give the rights back to indigenous people. That is an important part of healing the planet, healing with our fellow uh, human beings and paving the way for a new future. Number two, we have to organize and we have to fight against policies that privatize the ocean, consolidate the fishing industry, that advocate for the globalization of the seafood system rather than support for community-based fishing operations and support factory fishing and factory fish farms. There, is, there are a lot of parallels between holding fish in pens and holding fish in pens. And so we need to really start fighting those policies. And unfortunately, the administration just issued an executive order expediting the ability of factory fish farms to exist in the open ocean. We have to organize and support relocalization and re-regionalization of our seafood system and policies that support that. And when we develop any new solutions 
we have to ask three questions first. What's the scale of operation? Who owns it? And to what end? We need to know the answers to those three questions before any new operation, whether it's a fish farm, whether it's an algae farm, whether it's exploration of the sea, whether it's a fishing activity. We need to know the scale, matches the scale of the ecosystem. We need to know those who own it have its best interest in heart. And we need to make sure that the purpose of it is for the betterment of our existence on this planet. And finally, if you eat seafood, and I know there are a lot of people who don't eat seafood, and that's your choice, but we have to also acknowledge that telling people what not to eat is a very privileged position. There are a lot of people who can't make that choice. So if you are making the choice to eat seafood, I encourage you to not think about the species as much and think about your values. If you apply a set of values to your tomatoes and your chickens and your pigs and your lettuce, transfer those values because trust me, they're transferable to how you make your seafood choices. Diversify what you eat. Don't eat fake seafood. Eat seafood that actually looks like the real fish. Eat seafood that was closest to you, that was caught closest to you, that has the smallest uh, um, carbon footprint. Support businesses like community-supported fisheries and value-based seafood businesses. And if you don't know who those are, go to our website, localcatch.org, put in your zip code, and you can find a value-based seafood business near you. And finally, I just want to leave with this final thought. But back in 2009, we started to use the tagline, Who Fishes Matters? Because we wanted to really drive home the point that if you care about the future of the ocean and are existent in harmony with it, and you want to eat seafood, and you want to have sea salt, and you want to use sea sponge, or anything else you get from the ocean, you need to care about who's actually doing that work. Since Ferguson, since the movement for Black Lives, we felt more and more uncomfortable with that tagline. So you're the first one to hear it. We're no longer using that. You'll see our logo is no longer going to represent who fishes matters, those words. And we're going to figure out how to change all of our social media handles to represent this commitment. Because again, we're not only standing with people of color. We want to demonstrate that we're an ally and an accomplice. Thank you so much for having me here today. And I'm losing my voice. It's gone now. Thank you so much, Niaz. That was really powerful. And, and now because we're here to celebrate our beautiful blue planet, I want to I want to play a quick video that shows what Greenpeace is doing to protect our oceans. It's a it's a collection of, of footage showing both what we're fighting against and more importantly, what we're fighting for. Our oceans are on the verge of collapse. And we have all played a huge role in this. Now we must all play our part to stop it. Governments have duties. Companies have responsibilities. People have rights. Climate change is a human rights crisis. We can and must take action. I'm out here on the high seas with Greenpeace documenting the long life fishery. We are requesting permission to board your fishing vessel for inspection. Plastic never go away, not even in the Bermuda Triangle. They simply break down into smaller pieces, are eaten by marine animals, and can even up, up in our bodies. Let me tell you something. Y'all are crazy AF. <laughs> I can't really believe this is happening. humanity's noblest traits.
I'm s I found that very moving. I'm so, I'm so proud of Greenpeace's truly brave ocean work and what a perfect time <laughs> to introduce John Hosevar, who has overseen the oceans campaign for Greenpeace US since 2004, leading efforts to phase out single use plastic, improve the, the sustainability of seafood sold in supermarkets and establish a network of ocean sanctuaries. An experienced, I'm, I'm tearing up, an experienced, um, he's a submarine pilot and scuba diver. Hosever has collaborated with scientists from dozens of institutions on research projects from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Prior to, to John's arrival at Greenpeace, he co-founded and served as executive director of Students for a Free Tibet. He's focused on the intersection of human rights and environmental issues throughout his career. Please welcome John Hosevar. Thank you, Jane. It is great to be able to join you for another Fire Drill Friday. And you never know, but this time I feel pretty good about our chances to avoid being arrested. I believe the most important thing we can do right now for the ocean is to support the movement for Black Lives. This past weekend, we had a couple hundred thousand people marching for racial justice in Washington, D.C. as part of a, a movement of millions taking action all over the world. I've been a part of a lot of marches and rallies, including a couple that might have even been bigger than this one, but I've never seen anything like the movement for Black Lives this morning. As Jane knows better than most, you can work for decades sometimes to make the world a better place, chipping away at injustices, educating, organizing, and building power. And still, sometimes, like when Trump was elected three years ago, Feel like we're getting nowhere or even moving backwards. But this is one of those rare moments when systemic change starts to feel not just possible but inevitable. If you've been in the streets lately, you felt it. From Houston to LA, from Seattle to Minneapolis, the genie is out of the bottle and is not going back in until justice is served. We have a chance to make some fundamental changes and start eliminating the building blocks of institutional racism and social injustice. I highly doubt you're wondering what this has to do with the ocean. More than ever before, people understand that the fight for the environment and the fight for justice are the same fight. We cannot have a healthy planet without justice. We cannot have healthy oceans without justice. As my friend Diana Johnson said in her powerful op-ed in the Washington Post last week, how can we expect black Americans to focus on climate change when they are so at risk on their streets, in their communities, and even within their own homes? The most important thing, once again, that we can do for the ocean right now is support the movement for black lives. Greenpeace's fisheries work focuses on the intersection of the environment and human rights. They are deeply connected and at some point realized it didn't make sense to just talk about half of the problem or half of the solutions. We've caught and eaten most of the fish in the ocean. That has made it more difficult for fishing companies to be profitable. They have to spend more time and more fuel looking for fish. Cut costs some unscrupulous operators are paying fishermen less or even not at all. Companies force workers to stay at sea for months or even years. Right now, fishermen are being forced to work 18 hours a day, seven days a week. The penalty for getting too exhausted to work can mean getting thrown over the side to drown. Even the most basic conveniences are denied these workers. We spoke to fishermen who had to pay to use the toilet. These inhumane and often illegal practices enable companies to keep more boats on the water, which further drives the overfishing that started the problem in the first place. Also, we can have cheap tuna or shrimp. 
we've learned one thing from studying the impacts of fishing is that while industrial fisheries have gotten very good at killing fish, they've never been very interested in the health of the ocean that the fish live in. As much as 63 billion pounds of ocean life is killed each year as bycatch, discarded as just the cost of doing business. Bottom trawlers damage an area equal to half of the world's continental shelf each year, destroying corals and sponges that can be hundreds or even thousands of years old. As we have proven again and again, protecting habitat is critical to maintaining healthy fish populations. That's why we put so much effort into creating ocean sanctuaries, places that are free from extractive industries like fishing, drilling, and mining. Sanctuaries are the best tool we have to protect biodiversity, rebuild depleted populations, and to increase the resiliency of ecosystems to threats like climate change, ocean acidification. This was supposed to be a historic year for our oceans. The United Nations has agreed to establish a new global ocean treaty, and the final negotiations were scheduled for this spring. Pandemic, of course, has put those negotiations on hold, but the silver lining is that it's given us more time to build support for a strong treaty. If we get this right, we'll be able to scale up ocean sanctuaries for the first time, going from the 2% or so of the world's oceans that are strongly protected now to 30% by 2030. We also expected this year to be historic in terms of the fight to rid the world of, of single-use plastic. I know you all are well aware how bad plastic is for the ocean. The problems are much deeper than that though. Plastic is made from fossil fuels and is helping to drive new extraction that we absolutely cannot afford. Fracking, which produces the feedstock for a lot of plastic, is contaminating drinking water and impacting air quality. Plastic refineries, typically placed in or near communities of color, are notoriously toxic. It is impossible tonight to deny the racism behind exposing black and brown communities to poisonous chemicals so everyone can have bottled water and snackables. This is not a problem which we can solve by recycling. Very little plastic is recycled. Much is not even recyclable at all in any meaningful sense. But even the tiny portion of plastic waste that is recycled is still bound for incinerators and landfills. In all but very few cases, Plastic might be recycled once, but after that it gets turned into carpet or something that cannot be recycled again. 2020 was the year that the plastic industry showed their desperation, exploiting COVID fears to try to convince people that single-use plastic is the best way to keep everyone safe and their reusables are dirty and dangerous. Of course, the best available science doesn't support that at all, but the industry was still able to convince quite a few cities and even some states to pause their efforts to counter plastic pollution. We've worked hard to turn that around and have had a lot of success. And you'll see more from us on that front soon. In the meantime, I'm more sure than ever that the days of single-use plastic are numbered. I wanna ask you to keep your eye on one more thing. Right now, corporations like Deep Green are trying to find investors willing to finance their schemes to mine the deep sea. Together, we can stop this terrible idea before they're able to get it up to scale. Keep a lookout for more from Greenpeace on ways you can help. If we protect the ocean, she may just save us all. And if we work together right now and listen to and support our friends and allies leading the movement for Black Lives, we can knock down and dismantle the institutional barriers to justice and make it impossible for all of us to create a green and healthy future. For our friends and allies. Thank you so much, John. And uh, before I introduce our, our final speaker, I just want to acknowledge Marla, who has joined us from, from Toronto, Barbara from Buenos Aires, and Jorge from, he's with Greenpeace in Peru. I just love how international this Fire Drill Fridays community has become. Welcome to all of you. And now it's, it's really an honor to introduce Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. She's a, a marine biologist, a policy expert, a writer, and a 
a Brooklyn native. She's founder of Urban Ocean Lab, a think tank for the future of coastal cities, and founder and CEO of Ocean Collective, which is a consulting firm for conservation solutions. Her mission is to build community around solutions for our climate crisis. As she so accurately says, quote, when we think about solutions for the climate crisis, we should look to the ocean, unquote. Please welcome Dr. Ayana Johnson. Hi, thank you so much, Jane. Thank you, Greenpeace. Thank you, Fire Drill Fridays. It's really an honor to be a part of this. Um, and especially in this moment where people are connecting the dots between um, climate and oceans and justice, and to be here with you all in particular because Fire Drill Fridays and Greenpeace have been making those connections the whole time. Um, I've been watching Greenpeace's work on oceans for about a decade now and the work that they've done making sure we're connecting the dots between human rights and sustainable seafood has been really groundbreaking. So as Jane mentioned, I'm a marine biologist, I'm a policy nerd, I'm obsessed with building community around solutions for the climate crisis, but I'm also a black person living in the United States of America. And that means I work on one existential crisis, but I also lately find it really hard to concentrate because of another one. To quote Toni Morrison, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. The sheer magnitude of transforming our energy, transportation, building, and food systems within a single decade while striving to reach our um, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, that's already overwhelming. And black Americans we know are disproportionately more likely than whites to be concerned about and affected by the climate crisis. But we have all of these manifestations of structural racism, mass incarceration and state violence that mean environmental issues are only a few lines on a long tally of threats. So how can we truly expect people of color to effectively lead their communities on climate solutions when faced with this pervasive and light short, life shortening racism? So as I see it, here's the rub. If we want to successfully address climate change, we need people of color. There's simply no way around that. And that's not just because Pursuing diversity is a good thing to do, and not even because diversity leads to better decision making and more effective strategies, which it does, but because people of color are significantly more concerned about climate change than white people. 49% of white people are concerned about the climate crisis, but that's 57% of black Americans and 70% of Latinx people. That means there are more than 23 million Black Americans who already care deeply about the environment and could make a huge contribution to the massive amount of climate work that needs doing. And there is so much work that needs doing. When it comes to the ocean, we often focus on the ways the ocean puts up with endless waves of abuse from pollution, from oil spills and agriculture and factories and plastics to seawater heating up and acidifying due to greenhouse gases to driving fish towards the poles and disintegrating coral reefs to coastal ecosystems being bulldozed to build resorts and shrimp farms, the plunder of overfishing that causes fish populations to plummet and the deep sea being on the brink of being mined and torn up for minerals. But I want you to know that the ocean also offers us a way forward. It offers major opportunities to abandon fossil fuels, sequester tons of carbon, and create a sustainable food system. I'm talking about renewable offshore energy and algae biofuel, about coastal ecosystems and regenerative farming, I think we're really overdue for a reframe from seeing the ocean as a victim or as a threat to appreciating it as a hero. We have an incredible opportunity to harness the ocean as a source of climate solutions. And there are four of those solutions I want to highlight for you today. The first is offshore renewable energy. 
So we have around 40% of Americans who live in coastal counties. Imagine if the homes and businesses along our coasts were powered by offshore wind and waves. This doesn't have to remain a dream. Offshore, wind actually blows more strongly and consistently than it does over land. So floating turbines out there could mean more energy more reliably and produced near population centers. Um, while there are lots of these wind farms in development, right now there is only one wind farm operating in, in U.S. waters. That's Block Island Wind Farm a few miles off the coast of Rhode Island. Because we have these lengthy permitting processes and wealthy coastal property owners fighting proposals near their homes, we are way behind the UK and Germany and other European countries that are making use of this free, gusty resource. So there's also the potential for offshore wave energy and solar energy. And I think it's really important, obviously, that we take care with ocean ecosystems and migratory routes of species when we're choosing our installation locations. But we also need to move quickly. The second one is marine ecosystems, which can not only, um, which can sequester tons of carbon. So far, the ocean has absorbed around 30% of the carbon dioxide we have emitted by burning fossil fuels. And while lately there's been a lot of discussion about planting trees, billions of them, there's been no mention of the fact that about half of global photosynthesis is happening in the ocean. Wetlands and seagrasses and coral reefs and oyster reefs and kelp forests and mangrove forests and phytoplankton. Wetlands, in fact, can hold five times more carbon in their soils than a temperate or tropical rainforest. So, and even though New York and New Jersey have already lost about 85% of our coastal wetlands, what little remains actually reduce damages during Superstorm Sandy by over $600 million. So coastal ecosystems can often provide both cheaper and more effective shoreline protection than seawalls. And this blue carbon that the ocean is absorbing should not be overlooked. Protecting and restoring coastal ecosystems is a really good investment. The third ocean climate solution is algae biofuel. Biofuels produced on land, mostly ethanol from crops like corn and sugar, often rely on large amounts of water and fertilizers and pesticides and require so much fossil fuel to produce that they can barely be considered green. Algae, on the other hand, grown along our coasts um, is a great opportunity, although there's a lot more research and infrastructure development that's needed. Plus, as you know, seaweeds absorb tons of carbon dioxide as they grow, and, and kelp can grow two feet in a single day. So to me, photosynthesis seems like magic, even though I do understand the science of it. The fourth one is regenerative ocean farming. We can, and and arguably should use algae to power our bodies, not just our machines. With over 90% of global fish stocks maximally exploited or overfished, we really can't continue to rely on wild fish to feed the entire world population as we're approaching 8 billion. We need to rethink wild seafood and how we use it. But at the same time, industrial agriculture, as Neon met, mentioned, is also often unsustainable and focused on carnivorous fish that are requiring a lot of feed and infrastructure and polluting our waters. But there's a huge potential for a regenerative renaissance in ocean farming that's focused on seaweeds and filter feeding shellfish, like oysters and mussels and clams and scallops, which live simply off sunlight and nutrients that are already in the water. This type of uh, ocean farming can actually reduce local acidification of the water and improve local water quality, as well as being a very high nutritional value with a super low carbon footprint. So I just wanted to close by saying that as our economy is struggling to recover from the coronavirus triggered recession, this is an important opportunity to think about how we want to rebuild. The blue economy supports around 3 million jobs and contributes $285 billion to our GDP across tourism and shipping and fishing and construction, and that can continue to grow. In the next decade, installing offshore wind from Maryland to Maine could support over 36,000 full-time jobs. 
As part of a green stimulus package, a Climate Conservation Corps could put people to work replanting coastal ecosystems. Scaling regenerative ocean farming could create millions of direct and indirect jobs. And this, as I see it, is why we need a Blue New Deal in addition to a green one. The Green New Deal resolution merely mentions the ocean once in passing. But we know the ocean must go from afterthought to centerpiece if we are going to address the climate crisis at the order of magnitude that is required. And we need to value human diversity as much as we do biodiversity. So when you think of climate solutions, don't just think of rooftop solar panels and electric cars. Think also of our magnificent ocean. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. It, it was it was an honor to have you to have you with us. Did you hear how many jobs can be created through the things that Dr. Johnson just talked about? You know, so we need to be creating jobs now because of the terrible uh mess that our, our economy is in because of coronavirus. And so we should fight to have these big um, stimulus packages that are coming through Congress, not just go to big corporations in the fossil fuel industry, in fact, they should get none, but to go to things like alternative energy, renewable clean energy, and, and uh, replanting mangroves, and all the things that Dr. Johnson just said so many jobs. All the big economists say the best way to create new jobs and address our economic crisis right now is the Green New Deal. Clean, sustainable energy has more jobs than anything else. I want to thank all the remarkable and esteemed guests for being here today and so beautifully and profoundly explaining to us the, the critical role the oceans play in making our lives possible. They feed us, they they house millions of beautiful species. They drive our climate system. They, they provide oxygen, the oxygen that we need to survive and, and, and so much more. We have to fight for our oceans because our lives depend on it. The climate depends on it. And as we learned, there are plenty of things that we can do as individuals to protect the oceans. We can, we can use less single use plastic or no plastic at all. We can be responsible tourists, we can support local fishing communities, and we can eat more responsibly. Don't eat big fish. Eat the small ones, sardines, anchovies. Don't eat farmed fish, and the list goes on and on. But we need the big decision makers to take action, and that's the only way we can achieve true, bold, systemic change. We need massive corporations like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Nestle to stop forcing single-use plastic on our society. We need to stop being sold the idea that everything we purchase and consume has to be contained in plastic and throwaway materials. We need to stop deep sea mining before it demolishes ecosystems forever. And we need the United Nations to pass a global treaty that would enable us to protect 30% of our high seas. You know, scientists agree that marine sanctuaries would protect our oceans. We must create a global network of ocean sanctuaries that would put massive areas off limits to destructive industries like the ones that you heard about today. But to make that happen, governments have to agree on a strong global oceans treaty at the United Nations. And apparently, as you heard from John, the, the, the conference to discuss this treaty was supposed to happen this spring. And because of COVID-19, it's been postponed possibly until just after the first of the year. So we have plenty of time to gather petitions to show decision makers why this matters. So please, Text OCEANS to 877-877 in order to sign the petition. Now, again, OCEANS, that's plural with an S. OCEANS to 877-877. Thank you for listening and learning and taking action with me. I'm so, I'm so grateful to this community, and I hope you'll continue to show up, not only for our 
our climate and the planet for people of color as well and the movement for black lives. Environmentalists and climate activists must show up for black lives the way we do for our oceans and other areas of our planets. We must be in solidarity. Please keep in touch with me and my team by following us on social media and visiting firedrillfridays.com. See you next time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of this community and continuing to fight for climate justice. We can do this without you. Stay tuned for more information on the next virtual Fire Drill Friday. We'll see you in July.